Yes. He shot him. He shot him? Who did? Who? Todd told him. Did he threaten to kill you? No. Most of us want to believe we would know a killer if we saw one. But deep down, we know this isn't true. No matter how hard we try, it's impossible to accurately tell what lies beneath the masks people carry as faces. And to make matters worse, when we finally do, it's often too late. The killer has claimed his victims and we are left with nothing but the absolute horror of his violent deeds. In a way, this was the case with Todd Colehep. This is where we're at, Mr. Colehep. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property, okay? We have Caleb. Excuse me? We have Caleb. While Todd might have looked like a normal dude on the surface, he was far from that description. In fact, he was a monster with depraved desires, many of which he was bold with. So bold that people refused to take him seriously. To most people, he was just a weird dude. However, to Todd, these people were objects. Objects that he could remove from existence the moment they stood between him and his repulsive needs. And like most serial killers, the signs had always been there from the very beginning. Disturbing Beginnings In 1973, barely two years after Todd Kolhep was born, his parents divorced. That's the least ideal start for any child. For Todd, it was worse, because he was a child born with violent tendencies. His mother remarried quickly and very quickly gained custody of her son. But Todd would have none of it. He hated his stepfather so passionately and longed daily to be reunited with his biological father. I had to get rid of the anger. And nothing I did seemed to help. His mother would also tell reporters that he was an extremely sensitive child. He would throw sand, and if he wanted something, he would push him down and go get it. And there was at least one instance where he was surprisingly violent to a female classmate. He stabbed her in the leg. Not much. I mean, it didn't go deep. While this violent behavior against the opposite sex would serve as a very early foreshadowing to his violent future, he was also violent in his attitude towards animals. According to his mother, he brutally killed his goldfish when he asked her for a gerbil. And when his shocked mother asked him why he did that, he said, He just looked at me and said, I don't want it anymore. He also threatened to kill his mother, and she would have to lock him in his bedroom every night and lock herself in every night before going to bed. Did he threaten to kill you? Yeah. He was tall enough and big enough that I wasn't going to take a chance. So I locked him in his bedroom at night when he went to bit sleep and I locked me in my bedroom. Eventually, his aggressive and violent nature got so bad that he was institutionalized for three months in a Georgia psychiatric hospital. Can you imagine sending a child to a psych ward? It was that bad. Eventually, by 1983, Todd's mom separated from her second husband and Todd would get his wish. He was sent to live with his biological father in Arizona. This should have been a relief for him, but unfortunately, expectations don't always match our imagined realities. And if he thought he would find a responsible father in his biological dad, he was sadly mistaken. His biological father was a douchebag that neglected him and spent more time with his girlfriends. Todd grew to resent those women. The only meaningful time he spent with his father was when the old man engaged in his own hobbies, which included shooting stuff and blowing stuff up. It didn't take long for Todd to realize the error he had made, so he tried to return to his mother. But his mother wasn't too keen on letting her increasingly volatile son return to live with her. So she kept making excuses to extend his stay with his father. In 1983, it became clear why she made that decision. He had a crush on her, and he wanted her to be his girlfriend. And Todd went down there and got her. 
and brought her home. And at gunpoint. Yes. He did. Todd was 15 at the time, and the girl in question was a year younger than him and was babysitting her siblings when he approached her with a revolver. Todd forced her into his house, tied her up, gagged her, and assaulted her. And when he was done, he walked her home and threatened to kill her younger siblings if she told anyone what happened. Thinking back after all the grisly things he would do in the future, that threat was far from empty. Thankfully, the girl told, and Todd was arrested and charged with kidnapping, assault, and committing a dangerous crime against children. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and registered as an offender. But something the judge noticed before his sentencing should have ensured he stayed permanently behind bars. The judge said of Todd, 25 months of the most intensive and expensive professional intervention, short of God's, will provide no protection for the public and no rehabilitation of this juvenile. But the law is complicated. And even though Todd's probation officer would corroborate the judge's assessment, saying that Todd felt the world owed him something, 15 years was 15 years. And those 15 years were curiously calm and quiet. The first five years were a little chaotic, some mention of violence on his part here and there, but by the time he clocked 20, Todd went quiet. Not literally, but he adopted a facade of normalcy, like you and I, or as normal as someone who had 10 years to spend behind bars. In 2001, and after 14 years behind bars, Todd returned to society. During those 14 years, he attended and graduated from Central College, Arizona, with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Then he moved to South Carolina to live with his mother. Poor woman. Now, the question you're probably asking is, had Todd really changed? People often do their time and try to improve their lives, so did Todd somehow find rehabilitation in the prison system? I wish dark, dark tendencies. For two years, Todd took a job as a graphic designer in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Then in 2003, something unnervingly diabolical happened in town. Apparently everybody's been shot up here. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot, and the owner. In November of that year, Todd had bought a motorcycle from a motorsports store in Chesney, South Carolina. However, when he took it home, he realized that he struggled to ride the bike properly. So he decided to return the bike to the store and get a refund. But when he got there, the employees refused to take the bike, refused to give him a refund, and laughed at the fact that he couldn't ride the bike. So Todd did what any self-respecting psychopath would do in that situation. He pulled out his handgun and executed everyone in the store. The victims were identified as owner Scott Ponder, 30, service manager Brian Lucas, 29, mechanic Chris Sherbert, 26, and bookkeeper Beverly Guy, 52, who was Ponder's mother. Later, during his interrogation, after he got caught, Todd would reveal the unique set of twisted principles he functioned with as he slaughtered his four victims. I actually wasn't meaning to hit the mom. You actually what? I was not meaning to hit the mom. I prefer not to shoot women if I can. Okay. And I refuse to shoot a kid. Then he would talk about the incident with an equally twisted sense of pride. Yeah. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that door in under 30 seconds. You got a little bit proud. Unfortunately, the killing at the motorsports would go unsolved for almost 13 years until Todd's confession. Todd revamps his image. In the meantime, Todd began a project on himself that exhibited the main difference between a psychopath and a sociopath. Unlike a sociopath, Todd's psychopathic state meant that he could live, behave, and function like a normal member of society. Despite his criminal history, Todd pursued a real estate career and was able to, and in 2006 got a license after lying about the details of his dark past. 
He eventually built a successful real estate company that had tons of employees who worked under him. And through that time, he was known by most as a charismatic, hardworking businessman. However, the signs were still there. For example, while his employees described him as a great boss, they also talked about how he would playfully threaten to starve them if they didn't work on his website. Another business partner would tell the police that the man shamelessly watched porn in the workplace, and he didn't shy away from revealing, in reworked details, his status as an offender. As ridiculous as it might sound, this is something he was proud of. Prison time had done nothing to change the man. Then Todd picked up another hobby that should have set off all of the alarms. Between 2014 and 2016, Todd developed a love for Amazon, buying items like knives, guns, and tactical gear on the platform, and leaving bizarre reviews. One of the reviews read, Keep in car when you have to hide the bodies and you left the full-size shovel at home. Another read, Solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down if you're too old to care. And, haven't stabbed anyone yet, but I'm keeping the dream alive. And when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. You can't blame anyone who might have thought that the reviewer was just some funny guy with a dark sense of humor. Unfortunately, these reviews were Todd's actual testimonials. The man was giving feedback either as a joke he knew no one would take seriously, or as a fact he couldn't be bothered to prove to anyone but it was clear he liked the attention. Amidst all of this, Todd's weird tendencies were also noted at a Waffle House he frequented in Robach. It became so bad that female waitresses had to be swapped for males so that they could avoid the unending innuendos. Unfortunately, one of those waitresses, a lady named Megan Lay McCraw and her husband Johnny Joe Coxey, would go missing in December of 2015. And barely a year later, on the 31st of August, 2016, a 30-year-old lady named Kayla Brown and her 32-year-old boyfriend named Charles David Carver would also go missing. As Megan and her husband's disappearance grew cold, the family and friends of Kayla Brown and her boyfriend Charles immediately began to ask questions about their disappearance. And weirdly, someone began answering those questions on his Facebook account. It all began when a few days after the couple had gone missing, someone retroactively adjusted the details on Carver's Facebook page, which would have been long taken down. It read on July 1st, Carver and his girlfriend Kayla were expecting a daughter. On August 1st, they bought a house, and on September 1st, they were married. Unsurprisingly, friends and family were horrified, especially since Carver had never really been active on Facebook, and Kayla, who was supposed to be active, wasn't even posting. Carver's mother was certain it wasn't her son. This is just so out of character of him. As Kayla's mother tried her best not to panic. They're trying to keep it together because I'm not going to get anywhere if I fall apart. And more concerning, when the police searched their house, they found that Kayla had abandoned her beloved Pomeranian dog without food or water. Then another ominous text was written from the account. We are both okay. There's only one person that knows where we are. The person that means the most to me and Kayla. She knows where we are and we are coming that way forever. But friends of the pair weren't fooled and they took it into the comment section. As the imposter tried to impersonate Charlie and failed. As investigation mounted and the months passed, the police were eventually able to trace the couple's last location to Todd Kolhep's property. And what they would find was the stuff of horror. On November 3rd, Kayla Brown was found by authorities chained to the wall inside a metal storage container on his property. Investigators had tracked her down after tracing the couple's last known cell phone signals, after which they heard banging noises coming from inside the container. It was almost unbelievable. And when they asked Kayla what happened to her boyfriend, Charlie Carver, the incredibly strong Kayla didn't hesitate. Charlie? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? Who did? Todd Colehep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor, 
Lots of me down here. I never seen him again. The police moved quickly to arrest Todd in his home, and unsurprisingly, he denied killing Carver or kidnapping Kayla. But Kayla had all the evidence they needed. What did Todd do while you were there? We would get there between 1 and 3 o'clock every day, take me up to the main building, feed me, make me do whatever he wanted sexually, and then he'd put me back in the building. And then he would always come back between 5 and 7, take me back up to the building, feed me again. Most of the time, do whatever, get whatever out of and Todd would eventually also confess and he would help the investigators find the bodies of the waitress and her husband. He would confess to the motorsports shooting as well. And he would hint at the fact that there were more bodies, but he refused to reveal where they were. A year after his capture and while in custody, Todd wrote an eight-page letter to the Spartanburg Herald Journal saying, yes, there's more than seven. I tried to tell investigators and I did tell the FBI, but it was blown off. It's not an addition problem. It's a multiplication problem. Leaves the state and leaves the country. Thank you. Private pilot's license. At this point, I really don't see a reason to give numbers or locations. And after some pressure, he agreed to show investigators where he had buried two more victims. But when the investigators took him to the alleged spot, there was nothing to be found. Todd Kolhep was a maniac hungry for attention. Eventually, Todd was charged with one count of kidnapping regarding Caleb Brown's abduction and four counts of murder regarding the motor shop slaughter. He was also charged with three additional counts of murder for the murders of Charlie Carver, Megan Lee McCraw Cox, and her husband. However, he would avoid the death penalty in a plea bargain that saw him sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences with an additional 30 years for kidnapping and another 30 for a sexual assault charge. Todd Kolhep had murdered seven known victims, and in the wake of his sentence, one important question hung in the balance. Were there other victims to be found? If you listened to Todd, there were, and they numbered in the high tens. But just as no one can tell a killer from a normal person, there's no way to tell if there are any more victims, especially since Todd had refused to talk. And rather than giving this monster the attention he craves, investigators, victims, and the general public can find solace in the fact that he is shut behind bars where he belongs and where he will never again be able to hurt anyone.